Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. We worship you this morning, Lord God. Give you a sacrifice of praise, Lord God. Which is our reasonable service, Lord God. Lift you up on high, Lord. Because you're worthy, Lord God. You alone are worthy, Lord God. You alone are God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And I thank you, Lord God, for the blood that washes us white. Yes. Yes, Lord, I thank you for your word, Lord God, which is settled, Lord God, in, in heaven, Lord, before the foundation of the earth, Lord God. I thank you for the good things that you have in store for your people, Lord God. Lord God, you're such a mighty, awesome God. And I worship you, Lord God. I give you glory. I thank you for my salvation, Lord God. Lord, 41 years ago, you saved my soul, Lord God. Saved me from a fiery death, Lord God. And Lord, you changed me. You changed me, Lord God, and just like everyone here. You changed each and every one of us, Lord God. Yes, We're hallelujah. not the same person that we were, Lord God. Because your true salvation, true sanctification, you chip away at us, Lord God. Yes, you form us into the image of Christ. Yes. And that's what your power of your word does, Lord God. You chip away, Lord God. And sometimes it's not comfortable, but it's good. Yes. The end result is good. Yes. Amen? I remember my old pastor used to say, he didn't want to know me years ago. He said, and, 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 but he said, I like the results of what God has done in my life. Amen? And I think each and every one of us here can attest to that. Yeah. You're here today, you're here to worship God and to give Him the glory and the praise. And, and so, each and every one of us, I'm sure, has a testimony. Yeah. What God has done. He's a miracle working God. And He's still doing miracles today. Yeah. Amen? Yes. And if we believe that, we don't have to worry. God is with us. He says, yea, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you always, even unto the end of the age. That's a promise. No matter what you're going through. And there's people here going through some terrible things. Tough things, I should say. Tough things. But God will be with you and he'll bring you through. Yeah. That's a promise, isn't it? You know, I was reading Thessalonians. And Paul had written a letter to the first and second Thessalonians. There was there was a lot of anxiety with them because they thought they had missed the day of the Lord. Yeah. They thought they had missed the resurrection rapture. And so in First Thessalonians, Paul says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. He was speaking about a rapture, resurrection that will take place at the same time, the dead in Christ first. Then we which remain are alive will be caught up to meet him in the air. Amen. And he says, comfort one another with these words. There's comfort in those words. No matter what happens. The dead shall not, the, the, the dead shall precede the living, they'll go up first, and then we'll all meet him in the air. Yes. And that's coming soon. Yeah. You see that there's people, and, and, and I'm not going to debate it, there's people that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, a mid-tribulation rapture, and a post-tribulation rapture. But the only difference is seven years. Because the tribulation will last seven years. But whatever you believe, it is written, therefore it must come to pass. Yes. Amen? Yes. I'll There's going to come a time when the people that are in the graves are going to come out of the graves. Be resurrected up. And there'll be a time when, who knows when it's going to be. It could be today. All of a sudden we'll take off and meet the Lord in the air. Yeah. Amen? And we'll be changed in a millisecond. With a glorified body, and so shall we ever be with the Lord forever. 
That's a promise of God. Amen. Oh, I love the Lord and I love His Word. Yeah. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. In spite of all the things that are going on around the world today, we have a sure and faithful promise of God that our feet are planted on the rock and we shall not be moved. Yes. Yeah. We shall not be moved in spite of everything that's going on. Amen. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word, Lord God. I thank you for those that have come today expecting the Lord God, Father. And I know when your people come expecting, you answer them, Lord God. You meet their needs, whether it be for healing, for salvation, Lord God, whatever it might be, Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is here to answer the request and to, and to, and to, and to meet the needs of your people in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's worship the Lord without giving. We got ushers here today. Oh, 
for King David, I don't know if everybody knows that he made all the instruments in the temple. He pointed to singing, and when they played the instruments and when they sang, it was considered prophesying. You can prophesy with your instruments and with your voice. And what we heard today was prophesying. Yes. The worship team was prophesying unto us. Amen? Mm -hmm. And and I felt such a such a move of God in this house this morning. God is here to meet the needs of the people. Amen? Mm -hmm. And another thing that came to me, there is a doctrine called regeneration. And in regeneration, God changes your generation from Adam to the second Adam. Only God can do it. And that's why we sing this song, I am who you say I am. You're no longer sons and daughters of Adam because he's the progenitor, beginning of the human race. But you're sons and daughters of the living God because through the new birth, God has placed you yeah. in his family. Therefore, as we sing, I am who you say I am. It's so true. The great I am says that you are. Hallelujah. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So the talent and message today is monuments. And we're going to pick right up in Joshua chapter 4, starting in verse 20. And these twelve stones, which they took out of Jordan, did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan River on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you, until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us, until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. Forever and ever. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that the word said that it was settled, that you would before the foundation of the earth. The Spirit of God, the Son of God, and the Father all agree that this word that we have today was settled before you ever said, let there be and there was. And Lord God, that Father God, today, Lord, the new word is going to be prophesied, Lord God, because that's what preaching is. It's prophesying your word, Lord God, just as Samuel did. He founded the, the, the uh, school of the prophets. He didn't teach them to, to speak in tongues, but he taught them the word of God. And Father God, my brother, is going to prophesy this morning, Lord yes. God. Let your let people's ears be open, Lord God, to receive what the Spirit of God says today. In Jesus' name, Well, a lot had happened before this scripture <laughs> I just read to you. Moses had passed away. All the children that didn't have belief of the children of Israel, they had passed away. And so now, it was now time for their children to inherit the land of promise after wandering for 40 years. The, the problem was there was a big obstacle in the way. They were on the wrong side of the River Jordan. And at this time of year, the River Jordan was not only a, a large river, it was flooded and impassable. It had spread for miles in either direction, its banks. And, and so we see where God's getting ready to perform another miracle. And he, he orders the priest to start taking the ark and march towards the river. And the minute their toes touch, the river starts to recede. And before this happens, God speaks to Joshua and he says, I want you to take 12 men, one out of each tribe. And when you see the waters recede, I want these men to go into the middle of the river and grab large rocks like boulders. I want you to hoist them on their shoulders. And I want them to come back to Gilgal, to this side where you're going to inherit as a memorial. Amen. We're going to stack them together, 12 stones. And every time you see these 12 stones, you're going to be reminded of the great wonder I did for you this day. I receded the river, and I made it to where you walked on dry land, just like on the Red Sea. 
And on top of that, Joshua takes it a step further. And where the priests were standing in the middle of what should have been the River Jordan, he places 12 stones there as a memorial to what God had done as well. A monument, you might say. 12 stones is a monument to God, to His glory for the mighty things He had done. 12 stones so that when their children in the time to come would say, what do these 12 stones mean, Father? The Father would tell them the story of the great deliverance God gave them from the river. And how they started to pursue and acquire the promises that God had so richly given them. The definition of the word monument is a structure dedicated to the memory of a person or a special event, a memorial. The idea was when you saw the monument, it would bring to remembrance an exceptional person or event that took place. And such was the case for the people of Israel. When their children were to ask about the stones, they were to tell them that God dried up the flooded River Jordan. Not just the River Jordan, but the flooded River Jordan. To emphasize that nothing is impossible with God. And like this deliverance of the Red Sea, the people walked over on dry ground. And they were about to take possession of their promise. We still have monuments to this day. We, we have the Washington Monument. We, we have Mount Rushmore. The Eiffel Tower. I could go on and on, but I think you get the idea. The idea presented by monuments, the memorial they are to react, they can either be good or they can be evil. People and societies will build monuments in the hopes that they or their culture will always be remembered. They strive in vain hopes that they will always be remembered forever in the annals of history. That down through the ages, no matter how time passes, somebody will look at the structures they've erected and remember them and remember their civilizations. But God's word has something to say about this. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19 states, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. What time is that? The time of their death when they go to meet God. That they may lay hold on eternal life. In other words, what, what Paul is saying in this letter is, don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in your riches. Don't think that the great stores that you've built up are going to be a monument to you for times to come. Don't think that all the money you've acquired is going to mean that people are going to always remember you. That you are really something special. What God is saying is, you can't take it with you, but you can sure send it on ahead. By doing good works. By loving the brethren. By loving the unlovable. God is saying, you need to understand if you have riches, it's not because you were anything special, but I gave them to you. Amen. Titus 3.8 says it this way. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. So what God is saying is, you need to constantly be about your father's business. And not be so enamored and trapped in the things of the world. What God is saying is, it's not just a stone that you erect as a monument or a memorial. It's your very life. Yeah. And he's saying that you are judged by how you act, how you walk, the things you say, the attitudes you have. Right. If you're remembered in this world, it's not by what you have. It's by who you are and what you do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whether for good or for evil. God says that only what's done for His glory will stand the test of time. As the great British missionary Charles Studd says, and he puts it this way, two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing 
conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Amen. You see, we build monuments up to what we believe to be great things. But God is very explicit in saying that only the eternal, only what glorifies Him will stand the test of time will stand the test of eternity. As proof, I submit to you today the lives of two men of the last century. These men were the rock stars of their day. They were brilliant, brilliant scientists. Both were electrical geniuses that were so far advanced, it's almost like they were born out of time. The name of one was Steinmetz, and the other one was Tesla. If it wasn't for the work of these mighty great men, and the genius that God had given them, our life as you know it would be totally unrecognizable today. You see, these two men had pioneered electrical theory and the ability to transmit electricity over long distances. They developed the AC current uh, working which enabled this. They, they, in effect, enabled modern electricity to be brought to all of us cheaply and safely. They were brilliant men. Um, but you see, nobody remembers them. They were great men. There was another person that was born about the same time as they were, a, a small, nondescript woman. She was born in the Greek territory of Macedonia to Albanian parents. And her name was Anya Boyaju. Now the great thing about Anya was, she was so in love with God, that she wanted to dispossess herself of all material goods so they wouldn't be a distraction to her. She wanted to dedicate, to make her life a memorial, a monument to the greatness and the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. She was so in love with Him, she could not stand the thought of anything coming between her and God. She almost accomplished her task. When she died, she owned the simple outfit that she was wearing that day and the sandals that she used to be about her father's business. Nearly a hundred years later after Steinmetz and Tesla, the only thing that remembered about either one of them is that Elon Musk has a car named Tesla. They were brilliant men, but you see, these men were both agnostics. They, they had dedicated themselves to the monument of science. Their God was science. Steinmetz, when he died, the village he lived in tore apart his mansion and used the building materials to build other homes. When Tesla passed away, poor and broke and living in a New York hotel out of the charity of the hotel manager, the U.S. government came in and confiscated all of his papers because they deemed him that that necessary and that dangerous in the hands of someone else. The sad thing is, Tesla's father was an Orthodox priest, yet he considered people to be nothing more than meat puppets. How sad. To live your whole life, to have the, the talent, the grace, and the genius bestowed upon you by the God of lights, the Father of all things, and not to bother to build a, a monument to him at all, but to dedicate yourself to science. They built their lives as a monument to science and nothing else. And poor Anya, well, she built her life as a monument to God also. I'm pretty sure she's never going to be forgotten, at least not by the people of India. You see, you might know her better as Mother Teresa. I don't think anybody's going to forget Mother Teresa anytime soon. No. Only one life, the still small voice, Gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave, and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I wonder this morning, what are you and I building monuments to? Are we building monuments to our own main glory? Are we dedicating our lives to God? 
or we dedicate our lives to, to that, people will see the light of God in ourselves and thus repent and turn to God. Are we building works that will stand because they glorify God? Or will the works of our lives be consigned to the dustbin of history, like so many other people? You see so many great people that have lived their lives to the fullest in the flesh. And where are they now? Who remembers them? Everybody remembers Spurgeon. Everybody remembers uh, Mother Teresa. The list could go on and on. Why? Because it wasn't about them. It was about building their lives as a living sacrifice, as a monument to God. Are our lives a pleasing fragrance to God? Or do our lives not quite match who we claim to be every Sunday morning? About 35 years ago, I broke my neck and I was in a hospital. And uh, I was in a room with another man who claimed to be a Christian. And, you know, he, he let everybody know he went to this church. And he was a Christian. And the trouble was, he was also chasing after all the girls. I just laid there and just, I was like, oh. Oh. It was so, it was, I don't know, it was breaking my heart more the fact that my neck was broken or I was watching this guy destroy the witness of Christ. Yes. Mm. Do people get excited when they see you coming? Like, here's brother or sister so and so. Oh, I can't wait to give them a hug. Or when they see you coming, do they die for the nearest exit, praying that you haven't seen them? Come on. I'm not lying. When I was a young man, I went to the Four Square Church in Tampa. For those of you that don't know what Four Square is, it's like the Assemblies of God. They're big yeah. out west. There, there are not many churches here. But, you know, we, we had this great softball team, and, and, and a, a childhood friend of mine was on the team with me, and and he was going to church, and, and he came up to me one afternoon, he goes, Brother, he goes, I, I think the pastor's trying to avoid me. And I said, why would you say that? He goes, because I've seen him numerous times in stores, and I swear every time I go to walk towards him to say something, he's gone. He disappears. Brother, I love you, but i got to tell you something. All you do when you see a pastor is complain. You complain about your life. You complain about your wife. You complain about the church. I said, you know, and this was a godly man. If he had one strength, it was he loved people with the love of Christ. But you know, even saints can only take so much. Yeah. I imagine when he saw my friend, he did die for the next aisle over, so he didn't see him. So he wouldn't have to talk to him. It reminds me of the philosopher Socrates. He he had a nasty friend. And his other friends came to him one day and he said, this man is unbearable. Why is he so horrible? And he said, well, you see, the problem with my friend is wherever he goes, he has to drag himself with him. And there are a lot of people in the church world like that. They're not building monuments to God. They're building monuments to their misery. Some people are happier when they're miserable than when they're praising God and getting their healing. Yes. Because it's all about them at that point. Yes. Are you building your life as a monument to riches and possessions? Are you seeking riches? Listen, I, I'm not, let me clarify real quick. I'm not talking about working hard and providing for your family. If you work hard, if you have good things, if you've provided good things for your family, God bless you. You are a godly person because you're looking after your own. But if you are so consumed with the almighty dollar and having whatever you can have to the point where you forget God and you set aside your family, guess who your God is? And it's not God. Are you seeking riches? My friend, you are a glorified hamster on a treadmill. You're always going to be running and going nowhere. 
you're never going to have what you think you should have. Because your attitude is going to be, how much do I need? And it's always going to be just a little bit more. Why waste your time? And this is for everyone here. Whether you're rich or poor, no matter your state of life, remember this. If God can place a coin in a fish's mouth for Peter, he is more than capable of taking care of you. Yes. I tell you this morning, God not only allows U-turns, He allows you to properly tear down your monument of His bath and rebuild it as a memorial to Him. Yes. He allows you to turn your vessel from wood to fine gold. Amen. He allows the dents to be knocked out. He allows you to be polished up. Yes. He allows you to be that vessel of great honor that He's always envisioned you being. You are chosen. You're not forsaken. You have to allow yourself to be what God has chosen you to be. You're like, hey, that's great. Well, how about some nuts and bolts? How about some practical stuff? Give me, give me some practical stuff here. All right. How might I live to build my life a pleasing testimony, a sweet savor to God? When you get home, read Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the uh, living sacrifices that you make yourself a living sacrifice unto God, holy and pleasing unto Him. In other words, you don't just talk the talk, you walk the walk. I assure you this morning, holiness and sanctification may have gone out of style with the world, but it's very much in vogue with God. In fact, He demands it. One more scripture before I close. Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Boy, the rubber really hits the road there, doesn't it? But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the other things of others. When you look at the shape of our world in its current state, can anybody argue that it is literally coming apart at the seams? Yeah, come on. And do you know why? Because the Bible says that in the last days, right. men will become lovers of themselves. Yes. They will become high-minded. They will be disrespectful of authority and of parents. Look at these people taking over towns and issuing in violence. I think in Seattle they got a six block area they renamed Chaz. They're lovers of themselves. They don't put others first. No. It's always their way or the highway. Your opinion doesn't matter, especially if you don't agree with them. You want to live a godly life? You want to live a sanctified life? A life that's a beautiful monument to the glory of God? Don't strive. Don't do things for your own vain glory to be puffed up. But lowliness, humbleness. Seek the welfare of others first. In other words, be willing to listen to their side of the story. Be willing to consider where they've come from. Be willing to understand that they're not really your enemy. They just haven't been saved yet. Or they're maybe not as far along as you are in your walk with Christ. In other words, no matter how much they may hurt you, be willing to pray for them. Be willing to seek their welfare. And if you see a need, be willing to roll up your shirt sleeves and help them out. Man. You live a life like this, you're going to have a great life. You're going to have a wonderful life. Oh, you'll be persecuted. People that are jealous will say bad things, but you know what? You'll be so in tune with God. You're just going to glow. You're going to have the glory for God like you never knew. Only one life which will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Yes. And when I am dying, how happy I'll be 
if the lamp of my life has burned out for thee. Amen? Amen. Father God, I know it wasn't a long message today. But Lord, you've called us to greater things. You've called us to deeper things. And it is my prayer right now that all of us, starting especially with me, become more tender-hearted to other people. That we see people through your eyes, Lord Jesus. Yes. Father God, we're asking that you revolutionize us and make every life in here a pleasing monument, a memorial to you, Lord Jesus. May we live our lives to the last ounce of our energy in your service. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Does anybody need any prayer today?